They idolised the mother. Not so much the old man. No, they used to have their rows with the old man because he didn't like what they was doing. It, you know, no one likes their children to be like they was. Hello and welcome to another video. In this one we're going to talk about the Cray brothers mother and father, Violet and Charlie Cray. I will say Charlie Cray senior just so that we don't get confused with the twins elder brother Charlie. I don't think I will give the definitive story of the twins parents like how they met and stuff. That is easily found in the many books that have been written about the twins and I'm quite conscious of boring you. I think we will just talk about the twins parents generally with a few of my opinions thrown in. I didn't know any of the Cray family personally I have just read books and watched documentaries like most of you have so don't take everything I say as fact. I have said it before though facts are quite hard to pin down with anything related to the Crays. There is so many contradictions and different stories in the many books and documentaries and it is very hard to tell what is and what isn't true. The most reliable source we have at the moment is Cousin Rita's daughter Kim as things regarding the family go. This is my opinion though just going by what I have seen and read. To be honest I don't know too much about how kids were brought up in the 1930s and 1940s. While I like the era I haven't done too much research into it but I would gather the twins upbringing was fairly normal for that time. Their father Charlie Cray Senior was if you like on the edges of the criminal fraternity. While not an out and out villain he was certainly not completely straight. Being in the business as he was of buying clothes door to door which was then called on the knocker he would probably have not turned his nose up at anything stolen if he could turn a profit and he certainly would have associated with villains in the many pubs that he frequented as Charlie Cray Senior did like a drop of booze especially after a hard day's work on the knocker. Charlie Cray Sr. also avoided military call-up for the Second World War and he was on the run for quite a while, avoiding arrests when the police would turn up at the Cray family home, often hiding under the cupboard, under the stairs or the coal shed out in the backyard, even hopping over the fence in the back garden to hide in the twins Aunt Rose's house. These house raids by the police naturally instilled a bit of hatred for the twins for the police. The police turning up at all hours trying to catch the wily Charlie Cray Senior who I might add was never caught. Apart from those things the twins parents it seems were not really at fault for the twins becoming villains. Back in those days there were less opportunities for kids and especially if you were from a place of high poverty like the district of Bethnal Green in the East End where the Cray brothers grew up. On the whole the whole of the East End was synonymous with poverty. The area was notorious for its deep poverty, overcrowding and associated social problems. The Cray brothers grew up in this way of life. It could be argued that lots of other kids did too and they never became villains. That is some food for thought. So rather than the brothers parents influencing the twins into crime it was just the climate of the times where young gangs of teens would roam around and hang around on street corners and the twins gravitated towards that way of life themselves rather than any parental influence. In contrast the twins good friend Dickie Morgan he came from a criminal family background and it seemed to be instilled in all of the Morgan brothers. The Cray or Lee families were not really villainous at their core. The granddads on either side of the family were not villains. 
Hard men that would take part in street fights if needed, but not really villains. The aunts and uncles, as far as I can see, were also not into anything criminal, so no family influence really propelled the twins into a criminal career, unlike the twins' peers, the Morgans. With Charlie Cray Sr. often on the run for years on end, it was not good for the family, and I think when around Charlie was not the ideal father figure, or husband for that matter, often coming in drunk, he would bash his wife Violet. He was, through all intents and purposes, a bit of a brute. My nanny lived in 174 Valence Road. Nanny Lee was 176 and the twins were 178. So we was all together, old Charlie. When I was born, I got to know him as a nice, kindly old man, but he was horrible to her when she was younger. He beat her all the time, constantly. Jealous of her. Violet, the twins' mum, she was heavily pregnant and he beat her really badly. He kicked her in the stomach. She went into labour and she cried out for him to go and get a doctor. They went to the pub. She had to deliver the baby herself. The baby was born, a little girl. She lived for three minutes and she died. She, she never forgive him for that. This all came to a head one day though, when Ronnie heard Charlie Cray Sr. giving Violet a bashing. Their father, Charlie Sr., one day, they heard him shouting. He didn't know anybody was in. he come in pissed, drunk as usual. And Violet, the twin's mum, was doing some ironing or something and he punched her in the nose, just it for nothing, no reason. But Ronnie was upstairs in bed, and he heard, and he heard his mum cry. Ronnie's come down and said, heard the commotion. He's looked what's happened. He's punched his father on the nose, made his nose bleed. He went, you touch my mo our mother again, I will kill you. And that was it. It was done. He never touched her again. He never hurt her again. Obviously, a father like this will affect you, a father that will think nothing of hitting his wife, domestic violence. But as far as I can tell, most of the bashings Charlie Cray Sr. gave Violet could have been in their more younger years as a couple, and that was probably because most of the times when the twins were around, Charlie Cray Sr. was just not there due to being on the run from the army. For all the hate the father brought into the family though, it seems the Cray brothers' love they received from the rest of the family members was tenfold. Charlie Senior was not typical of the family. Violet adored all three sons, and so did the rest of the family. The twins and Charlie grew up with lots of love around them. The twins were the centre of attention in the family. They was Violet's pride and joy. She took great pride in taking them out in their pram, with neighbours leaning over taking a look at the twins and saying how gorgeous they were. The twins were made to feel special from an early age and be the center of attention. They would still want to be special and the center of attention for years to come. According to author of the best-selling book, A Profession of Violence, Violet Cray called the twins, my little bunny rabbits. Charlie Cray would have equally been fussed over, but probably not to the extent the twins were. The birth of Charlie Cray though did reunite Violet and Charlie Cray Sr. back with the Lee family as for a while Violet didn't see eye to eye with her father over her relationship with Charlie Cray Sr. He was very disliked by the grandfather Jimmy Cannonball Lee. He highly disapproved of Violet's marriage to Charlie Cray Sr. I think he despised the Cray family as a whole and he did have a run in at one time with Charlie Cray Sr's father, who was also known as Jimmy. Not too much is said of the twins' relationship with their father. Books mostly have bits about the twins. They didn't really like their father much, and this is what is published in most books. Reg himself said it was more of an East End way for the kids to be more attached to their mother back then. The way it was in East End, um... Uh, sons would bestow more affection or love on the mother than they did the father because it was the East End's way. 
1956, Charlie Cray Sr. did write to the court when the twins were up at the Old Bailey for assault on Terry Martin. The letter reads, If you will at least believe me, sir, they are the most respectful and good-natured lads anybody could wish to meet. So kind to my wife and I, and everybody, in their thoughts and actions, and only do good to everybody. With my guidance, and my wife, and my son Charles, they will make good. They are at present in a good business, with every chance of making good. Can I appeal to you again, for the chance to enable this lad of mine to lead a moral and good life? Hoping my appeal may receive your kind consideration and mercy. The letter was dated 4th of November 1956. As we know, Reggie was acquitted, but Ron got three years. This showed that Charlie Senior felt the need to try and help his sons in need, with the threat of a long prison sentence looming. Whether he'd done this on his own accord or not, who knows, or if Violet had to persuade him. When Charlie Cray Senior found out about Ronnie's homosexuality, he wasn't best pleased. Homosexuality was very frowned upon in them days, and it was illegal until 1967 in the UK. In Britain alone, there are at least one million men and one million women who are homosexual. Now, for some reason, the law takes an entirely different attitude toward the two sexes in this matter. Between women, homosexuality is perfectly legal, but between men, it's a crime, rendering the offender liable to several years of imprisonment. There are only half a dozen countries in the world in which it is a crime, but for some reason Britain is one of them. So what's it like then to be a male homosexual in Britain today whose only choice is between a lifetime of complete sexual abstinence or being a criminal? There is a good passage in the book Crazy Days by firm associate Mickey Fawcett that I will read about Charlie Cray finding out about Ronnie being homosexual. Charlie Cray Sr. staggered through the door, adjusting his tie and cuffs. He's here, Mum, rotten drunken old cunt, said Ronnie. Violet was working in the kitchen, and although she must have heard the complaints, she didn't respond. Charlie sneered. What I've heard about you today, son. Well, I never. I can't believe it, he said. You're gone. You're gone. Ronnie's eyes had become fixed, staring. His hands gripped his knife and fork very hard. Without turning, he slid his eyes around to gaze at his father, and his whole head shook with rage. Charlie continued, What they've told me about you today down the 99, a pub in Bishopsgate. Oh, you make me feel sick. It's disgusting. Charlie had discovered his son was gay. He might not be able to say the word homosexual, but that was what he meant, and Ronnie knew it. Shut up, said Ronnie. Shut up. You're fucking gone, you are, said Charlie Cray Sr. At this, Ronnie jumped up, startling the dog, and took a couple of paces across the room to face his father, knife and fork in his hands. I sat at the table, not looking at Dukey Osborne, dying a death, just listening as Ronnie repeatedly shouted, Shut up! into his father's face. The terrier joined in the family bust-up, trotting across the room and biting the old boy on his leg. Ronnie had his knife in one big fist, raised above his father. He held himself back, though. The knife grazed one cheek. You cut me, son, shouted his father. Ah, oh, what have you come to? Looking over Ronnie's shoulder, he called into the kitchen. Violet, he's cut me. Oh my God. How true this is, who knows, but it is believable. Knowing that there was conflict between the twins and their father, it does seem to be a very love-hate relationship. They loved him because he was their father, but hated him, maybe for the person he was and even more so after he had had a drink. Obviously I don't know this, as I wasn't there, but this is my take on it. Violet on the other hand, by all accounts, accepted Ron's homosexuality, and according to Ronnie in a later Broadmoor interview, Jess said to Ron, good luck to you. There was no question that Violet would be okay with this though, such is the way we are told Violet doted over Ron, and Reg for that matter, there was no question that she would probably accept anything of them as long as they were happy. Violet seemed to have bestowed more love on Ronnie. They were both loved by Violet of course, but I think Ronnie being very ill from diphtheria in his childhood created a bigger bond with Violet. The thought of losing Ronnie at that time would have been very real. 
He was very ill and could easily have died. Reg was ill with it too, but he quickly recovered. Violet had also lost a child before, that was baby Violet, so this would have weighed heavily on her mind during the twins' illness, and more so with Ronnie. The twins could not do much wrong in the eyes of their mother Violet. There is zero chance that she didn't know what the twins were up to. She would have heard things and seen things, but she must have just turned a blind eye to it all. She must have just accepted whatever the twins told her, how they got their money, how they got their clubs, the blooded white shirts she would have had to wash on a regular basis. The twins often done business at the Cray family home, nicknamed Fort Valance, and as firm member Connie Whitehead once said, it would be hard to talk in the Cray family home and not be overheard by Violet or whoever was in the house at the time. Then she must have sort of known what they was, you know, what they was up to and that, because you, the house was that small, you couldn't really talk in there and she couldn't hear. It is said that Reggie's first wife, Frances Shea, was a bit disliked by the family and wasn't treated very well. We hear this from the twins' very good friend, Johnny Squibb. Yeah, Raz was only over the, the family and the way that they treated Frances, and she had good reason to. You know, they didn't treat her nice at all. Johnny doesn't really have any reason to lie about this, so we could maybe take this as fact that something like this did happen with Frances and the Cray family. The way Violet was with the twins and a deep love for them, you could kind of see this as being true. You could maybe see that Violet maybe thought Francis was not good enough for Reggie, even though Francis seems to be a good but troubled person. I suppose you have to ask who would be good enough for Reggie in the eyes of Violet. Maybe nobody. We do only have a few things to go on how the family really treated Francis and her relationship with Violet. Like most things Cray, we are left to guess and to come to our own conclusions as we hear so many different things that conflict with each other. For example, while on the subject of Frances, some say she was a timid soul, others say she was the complete opposite of that and a bit of a wild child who would speak her mind and not be the scared bunny rabbit that we're led to believe. Maybe Frances did hold her own when and if she was picked on by the family, I've not read the book Tragic Bride so I don't know if Frances' relationship with Violet or Charlie Cray Senior is wrote about in that book. I'm more inclined to believe the words of Johnny Squibb that he at least witnessed the family treating Frances badly at the very least one time and enough so that it would stick in his memory to mention it many years later in a documentary. It's kind of unknown what Violet and Charlie Cray Sr's reactions were to the murders by the twins, or shall I say the accusations of murder for Ronnie murdering George Cornell in 1966. Reggie's killing of Jack McVitie was more cloaked and wasn't really known widely until the twins arrest. People were talking about Ronnie's murder of George Cornell. It was a very public murder and it was being talked about. Violet must have seen and heard the whispers. We can assume she would have been in denial of this. My Ronnie wouldn't do that. The arrest of the twins for this murder and subsequent release with no charges would have confirmed this for Violet. Confirmed her Ronnie would not do such a thing. This illusion would have been shattered in May 1968 when the twins and the firm were mopped up for the final time and the twins were charged with a murder each and also in connection with the disappearance of the mad axeman Frank Mitchell. Even at this point Violet may have been in denial and her lovely boys would get off because after all they were innocent. This was not the case and the twins were jailed for life with a recommended 30 years imprisonment imposed on them. Older brother Charlie got 10 years. Charlie and Violet were present throughout the trial and what they made of lots of the twins friends giving evidence against them who knows some of these men would have sat in violet cray's kitchen at fort valance and had tea and sandwiches and now they were singing like canaries giving evidence that would help convict her three sons to lengthy spells behind bars the twins were put as far apart as possible with ronnie going to durham prison and reggie to parkhurst 
It seems the authorities wanted to make it as hard as possible for people to visit them. This did not deter Violet Cray and she faithfully visited both twins. And this is a huge testament to Violet because this would not have been easy at all with a distance of over 300 miles between the twins. Plus you have to factor in another 40 plus miles from Braithwaite House to visit Charlie Cray in Chelmsford Prison. Charlie would only serve six years before he was released in 1975. Seeing as Violet never drove, and I don't think Charlie Senior did, it was probably left to faithful friends of the twins to drive her to these prison visits. We can assume that somebody like firm member Tommy Cowley would have done this. Violet did write to her MP though, and eventually the twins were reunited in Parkhurst Prison in the 1970s. This would have been a huge weight off Violet Cray's shoulders. Although still quite a distance that involved a ferry journey, it was a lot easier than doing that and also going up to Durham. Ronnie would end up closer to home when he was put in Broadmoor, in Crowthorne, in Berkshire in 1979. But Violet would not have visited Ronnie long there, as in 1982 she died of cancer, aged 72. She had been ill for some time and I believe this was kept from the twins. Ron and Reg would famously be allowed out for their mother's funeral and it was the first time in 13 years that they had been seen. Charlie Cray Senior, who may have accompanied Violet on some of the visits, was left as the only parent to visit the twins. But seven months after Violet died, Charlie Cray Senior also died he was 75. The twins chose not to attend Charlie Senior's funeral. Two stories have been given for this. One is that they did not want all the media attention that their mother Violet's funeral got and the other is that they just didn't like him and chose not to attend. I suppose you can choose which one of those you would like to believe. Despite the twins shaky relationship with their father I do believe they did love him in their own way. It was probably a love-hate thing. He was in and out of their lives when they were younger due to him being on the run for not joining up with the military when he was called upon. The twins do speak of him in endearing terms on some occasions. They fondly remember him hiding in the cupboard under the stairs or hopping over the back garden fences when the police visited 178 Balance Road to try to arrest him. A lot of love would have been lost though by the way he treated his wife, their mother. We're told he was a bit of a bastard to her at times. And this is verified by the twins cousin Rita's daughter Kim. So we can take that as absolute fact. I don't know how Charlie Cray's relationship was with his father Charlie Cray Senior. But like the twins I would assume a lot of love was lost for him with his treatment of his mother by his father and that is understandable nobody likes and should stand for domestic violence we all know about Violet's love for her boys and especially the twins she put them on a pedal stool from the start proudly taking them out in their pram to show off to whoever was available and her pride for the twins continued until her death in 1982 it seems the twins could do no wrong in Violet's eyes, she saw nothing but good in them and it seems she turned a blind eye to any bad that was said about them. They were, as author John Pearson says, her little bunny rabbits. It is hard not to admire Violet for her love and support for her sons after their convictions. Words can't really do justice to how hard it would have been to visit them every week. Travelling a very long distance for probably an hour at the most visit. But we also have to remember the mothers of George Cornell, Jack McVitie and Frank Mitchell. They lost their sons due to the actions of Ronnie and Reggie Cray. So any hardship Violet suffered in those years was not on the magnitude of the victims' families. At least Violet could visit her sons no matter how heartbreaking it was. I think I've said all I can on Violet and Charlie Cray Senior. As always, I did not know these people. I'm just basing things on books I've read and documentaries I have seen and just formed my own opinions on it. 
Like I have said many times, it is hard to know exactly what happened in the lives of the twins and their family. There is so many conflicting stories given by people who did know them and who were around at the time of the twins' freedom. Before I go, I would like to just look at a couple of places that feature in the Cray story. One of the places I'm not 100% on if it's the right place, but the chances are pretty high that it is, and we will start with that one first. It is this bungalow in Loxham Road in the Chingford area of London. The bungalow was owned by Cray associate Charlie Clark, not to be confused with Charlie Nobby Clark, who was on the Cray firm. This Charlie Clark was said to be a cat burglar. Charlie Clark can be seen with Ronnie Cray and Lord Boothby in a photograph taken at the Society restaurant, seated on the far left next to Lord Boothby's butler. This I am sure will be the bungalow that Charlie Clark owned, as it is the only bungalow in the road, unless of course some were knocked down. As far as buildings go, I would assume that bungalows are a newer type of building in the scheme of things compared to others, so I don't know why they would knock down a bungalow. The road itself is not very long and no houses on it seem to be new builds. I think we can say with a certain degree of certainty that this was firm associates Charlie Clark's bungalow. Charlie lived here with his wife and it is said he had many cats. The bungalow played a part in the story of the Crays as it was here that Ronnie Cray and Ian Barry lived for a while after the shooting of George Cornell in 1966. They lived here shortly after staying with the Till family in a flat in Moresby Road in Upper Clapton. The bungalow was also the place where Freddie Foreman was called to to see Ronnie Cray and some of the firm. That day Ronnie wanted to kill a man called Billy Gentry. Billy Gentry was a Cray associate and I believe he was once the manager of the El Morocco Club that was in Westminster and was owned by the twins. As Fred told the story of that day, some of the firm including Albert Donoghue and Connie Whitehead were sent out by Ronnie Cray to find Billy Gentry and bring him back to the bungalow in what seems for him to be murdered by Ronnie Cray. Nobody's really sure what Billy Gentry done to deserve this. At last the members of the firm came back saying they couldn't find him and that seemed to be that. I believe this would have happened towards the end of Ronnie's freedom. It was from this episode that Freddie Foreman was supposed to have discussed with others about ironing out the twins with the meeting being held at Simpsons in the Strand. As we know this never happened as it came on top anyway with the police when the twins and the firm were mopped up in 1968 including Freddie Foreman. That's really it about the bungalow. Like I said I can't be 100% sure that it is the exact bungalow but it is the only one in Loxham Road and Charlie Clark did live in a bungalow in Loxham Road in Chinford. Next up we keep on the subject of Freddie Foreman and this is Adelina Grove in Whitechapel. This road is where Freddie Foreman was sorted out with a flat by the twins and older brother Charlie when Freddie came over to the East End while he was on the run from the police in South London. The East End was seen as a bit of a safe haven by Freddie. He wasn't known by the local police. I wish I could tell you where the flats were or are but I don't have any knowledge of that. But this is the road Adelina Grove and it is just a stone's throw from the Blind Beggar pub where Ronnie Cray shot George Cornell. The last place I want to show you, I have covered it before in a video but it was deleted and this is the site of Longgrove Hospital today. Lots of the buildings are still there today and they're used as flats and such. Not really much I can say on this, just showing you that some of the buildings are still there and in use. I think that will do for this video, I think it's long enough now. I hope you've enjoyed it. Like always, I can't really bring you anything new on the craze, but I still hope you have enjoyed it and I haven't bored you to death. I'm not sure when the next video will be. I feel I'm coming to the end of the craze story now, unless I can come across anything else to bring you. 
Since I started doing these videos in 2016, I have noticed that a few channels have sprung up in recent times detailing British crime, and that is good to see. I myself don't think I would cover any other crime. I have thought about it, and I just don't really know enough about other things, and I would not be that confident in speaking on it. I kind of want to keep the channel all things cray if I can. I kind of like it that way and I hope you do too. So I will leave it at that for now. I would like to thank you all for watching my videos and for all your comments and I will see you again in the next one. Thank you. I my mum was uh, um, a really very warm person. She would never uh, run anyone down. And she's just all giving, she's giving all the time.